Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, or even good morning. Since this is a virtual armchair tour, rather than the normal done at the Nyack Library or the Valley Cottage Library, well, it could be any time of day that you're watching this. But I thank you for joining me. My name is John Patrick Schutz. I am the village historian for the village of Nyack. And I'm coming to you from the old stone meeting house on North Broadway in Upper Nyack. This is the oldest church building still existent in Rockland County, and it has pertinence to the story I'm going to tell you today. Our topic today is John Green and his effects on Nyack and the village. There's an awful lot of John Green's influence left behind in the village of Nyack even 200 years after he first arrived here. John Green was an entrepreneur, he was a businessman, he was a visionary. He saw a future where our little village of Nyack, that went from 200 people in 1800 when he arrived to 2,000 people by 1860, became a center for commerce and industry on the Hudson River, close to New York City, for the first time. John Green was born in 1772. His wife, Sarah, before he knew her, was born in 1775. He first arrived in Nyack around the year 1800. He had had a sawmill in New York City that had a catastrophic fire and he lost everything. To the point where when he arrived in Rockland County, he wound up being an indentured laborer for the Cornelison family in South Nyack. However, uh, he, by 1804, only four years later, had gotten enough of his fortune back that he was able to own a sloop on the river that hauled quarry stone and lumber both to Albany and to Manhattan. He decided that we really needed a better port here in Nyack. By 1812, John Green had become so prosperous again that he was able to be one of the five founders of the very church that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, he put money up and they built the first Methodist Episcopal Church, which we now all call the Old Stone Meeting House, uh, and was part of that congregation for the rest of his life. Then, by 1819, he began to build the building that we call the John Green House. Interestingly enough, that house was not really built as a residence. You can see it at 23 Main Street. It's undergoing renovation right now. Uh, and it was, interestingly enough, one of the last Dutch sandstone colonials ever constructed anywhere. You see, we have a very special form of architecture that's only native to Bergen County, New Jersey, the Bronx, Westchester, Rockland, and Putnam counties of New York. It's called a sandstone Dutch colonial, and it is a structure that's built with sandstone walls, usually anywhere from 21 to 28 inches thick, with what's called a gambrel roof. That's sort of a barn type roof, where first it has sort of a fairly flat pitch and then it goes to a steep pitch. Here in the Hudson Valley, the Dutch added an extra little flip at the end of the roof so that when water hit the roof and came down, it would flow down the sides and then shoot out away from the house, keeping the foundation of the house dry. Some of these sandstone colonials, like the ones in Tepan and Blauvelt, West Nyack, that date all the way back to 1710, 1720, 1750, still have the driest basements around. So they knew what they were doing. Anyway, John Green's house uh, was built as a warehouse. It was built in 1819. And as far as we know, was the last Dutch sandstone colonial structure ever built. Uh, later, it would be used for a residence and uh, for apartments. But when he first built it, it was, again, as a warehouse. Next to it, he had a general store. 
And then John Green built a pier at the bottom of Main Street. That pier became very important because soon he would then develop a steamboat. A steamboat that would do a daily trip to New York City and back that would take both passengers and freight. They started building that steamboat in 1826 and it was ready for use by 1828. The steamboat was originally supposed to be named the Nyack, but instead wound up being called the Orange. However, according to all histories, most people just referred to it as the pot cheese because they considered the 75 foot long boat to be one of the ugliest things they'd ever seen in their lives. Now, I'm going to break a little bit from John Green for a second just to give you a little background material that'll give you a better sense of what was going on in context at the time. So, the first European settlers in Nyack, well, they hit here in 1675. Mostly, what they did was farm for themselves, and the industry that was here was quarrying. In Upper Nyack and in Grandview on Hudson, brownstone was quarried and shipped either to New York City or to Albany. In fact, the Albany Capitol building is built of Nyack sandstone. Um, and that was used to build both of those cities. It was our most important import for very or export, I should say, for a very long time. Uh, however, if you ship stone on a sloop, a wooden sloop, it hangs very low in the water, and it takes a very long time to get anywhere because it has a decent amount of resistance against the wind. Uh, there had to be a better way to do things. Things stayed the way they were through the Revolutionary War. In fact, we were important during the Revolutionary War because we were one of the few places with gun emplacements. And the first naval battle of the Revolutionary War actually took place in our Tappan Zee. Um, the English did not like Nyack because any time an English ship tried to sail further up the Hudson than Nyack, it was fired on by the shore guns. And they learned to absolutely loathe the people of Nyack and their shore guard, as they were called. Then the revolution ended, and in 1806, Robert Fulton and his steamboat first started sailing, or chugging, up and down the Hudson, making a regularly scheduled stop at various cities and towns along the way for the first time ever. Before this, with wind travel, you could never be sure that you would make it, and you certainly couldn't schedule almost to the hour how long it would take you to get there. Well, Clinton could and did. That was what gave John Green the idea that, hey, we could probably use one of those in Nyack. Unfortunately, up until 1820, Robert Fulton had an absolute monopoly on steamships on the Hudson. Now, imagine if you will, you discover a new technology that makes life better for everybody, and then by law you limit it to only one guy being able to do that. Well, that was kind of really dumb, especially because the Erie Canal was coming into existence. The Erie Canal was going to be a waterway that connected the Hudson River all the way over to the Great Lakes and open up the interior of the country to shipping and freight and the ability to pass goods back and forth from the Midwest to the Atlantic coast. How can you have the canal be effective if one of the portions of this traffic is controlled by one person? Well, obviously, Fulton finally lost his monopoly on Hudson River traffic, and other people were allowed to build steamships. John Green was one of the first to do that. And his pier at the end of Main Street would stay and be built bigger and bigger well into the 20th century. But he did establish with his steamship the first daily travel to New York City. And they would carry stone, and they would carry some local produce. At the bottom of Depew Avenue, where Memorial Park is now, at the time, there were a bunch of greenhouses. 
They grew vegetables during the winter and flowers year round. And those greenhouses, plus the ice that was being shipped from Rotten Lake, are basically responsible for helping New York City get its restaurant scene started around 1820. Rotten County helped fund and helped start the, life, the nightlife of New York City. Um, it's kind of one of those interesting things that it's nice to remember that we had an important place. Um, we built their brownstones and we fed their people. John Green knew that this was going to continue and become more and more important. Other local investors began to build other boats. But there was still one difficulty. And John Green had a plan for that too. See, over in Suffern, in the western part of the county, we had woolen mills, we had iron mills. There was a nail factory over there, iron was being mined, but to get it to New York City was very difficult. At the time, the only road across the county went north and came out in Haverstraw. Haverstraw is not an easy place to get to the water because you have to go over either high tour or low tour and then down a very steep slope to get to Havistraw Bay. Havistraw Bay is much shallower than Nyack's Bay. And so it was pretty obvious that perhaps we ought to move the port further south. Another advantage that Nyack has is we are one of the only breaks in the New Jersey Palisades and Hudson Highlands where you can get from the interior to the water easily. If you've ever wondered why the Tappan Zee Bridge is where it is, yes, part of it is because it had to be a certain distance away from New York City for it to be under the New York Thruway uh, Authority rather than Port Authority. But the other reason is actually because it's basically the only place you could carve a major highway. Uh, from the interior to the waterside and cross. That's why it wasn't done at Piermont and uh, Irvington, even though that seems like a much more likely place. You could get maybe a two-lane road coming into Piermont and not the huge highway that we have coming across the Tappan Zee Bridge. John Green knew that that slot was definitely a place where a road could be built from Suffern to Nyack. And so the Nyack Turnpike idea was brought up. In fact, it was passed by the New York legislature in 1816. It didn't get built and finished until 1830, partly because the people that were in Haverstraw did everything they possibly could to block this road from being built. But some of the other reasons were it was actually pretty difficult. The Nyack Turnpike would become what we call Route 59. Now, if any of you have ever gotten flooded out on Route 59 in West Nyack, you'll know what one of the difficulties of crossing the county at the time was. They came up with a much better idea than we have now. There was a causeway that was built that brought the road up a good 20, 30 feet above the marshes so that it never flooded out. Of course, you couldn't do that now because no car would ever be able to get off to go to either the mall or the Dunkin' Donuts or anything that's over there. But interestingly enough, back in 1820, 1830, they had a much better way of crossing that marsh than we have right now. There's a very funny thing about the Nyack Turnpike when it finally opened. It was a toll road. You had to pay on the Suffern end and you had to pay on the Nyack end. The toll house on the Nyack end was about halfway between where McDonald's on 59 is now and the Audi dealership on 59 is now. You'll notice if you've ever been on Waldron Avenue in central Nyack, it leaves 59 just before where the McDonald's is and it heads south. Then after about two blocks, it turns and makes a complete 90 degree turn and heads west. Goes west for a good decent amount of time, down a hill, around a couple of turns, and rejoins 59 or 
the Nyack Turnpike, at the bottom of a hill around a curve from where that toll house was. Waldron Avenue came into being and said, therefore, the entire hamlet of central Nyack came into being by people trying to jump the turnstile. Yep, it's true. Waldron Avenue was a path that allowed you to avoid the toll, but get onto the road before it went up onto that causeway and you'd never have been able to climb up on there. So just a little bit of trivia, a uh, nice way to know that people haven't changed in 200 years. Uh, we still all try and want to save a buck when we can. That's what we've got on John Green getting the turnpike done. The turnpike made Rockland able to industrialize. They brought iron from Suffern. They brought produce from inland. They brought the woolens that were being done in John Suffern's mill in what would become the village of Suffern. And they were shipped every day on the orange. And John Green prospered and continued to do so as one of the founders of Nyack well into the 1840s when he finally passed away. His wife was still alive according to the 1860 census at the age of 85, uh, living with one of their daughters at the age of 48. His grandson would go on to write a book in the 1880s called The History of Rockland County. That book serves as a Bible for myself and any of the other historians, Upper Nyack Village historian, South Nyack Village historian. It is one of the best and well-researched books that we have on the history of the Nyacks and settlement here. John Green left behind him an interesting and wonderful and vibrant legacy when it came to commerce, business, industry, and looking to the future as seeing new hope in the future. Now, this is the point where we have to discuss the elephant in the room. I'm talking about slavery. Are we in the process of restoring a building that was built by slave labor? It's a good question. John Green owned two human beings according to the 1810 census. Slavery began here in New Amsterdam in 1626 when 11 Africans were brought to become laborers for the West India Company in Manhattan. Slavery in New Netherland had certain levels. There was slavery, there was half slavery, indentured servitude, and then there was free. Um, as you progressed through those, obviously you had more opportunity and life became better. The English changed that. You could be born into slavery. The revolution came, we became our own country. New York was one of the states that really didn't like slavery very much. The Manumission Society was founded in 1785, and by 1799, a law was passed that said, no one born after this date is a slave. And went on further to say that those who were still enslaved gradually had to be freed. Unfortunately, they gave him 25 years to do that. Slavery was done thank God, by 1827. Interestingly for women, it was done by 1825. I don't know why they made a difference, but there was a difference there. So we get back to John Green, owning two slaves. Did slave labor build the John Green house that we are restoring right now? It's possible, but it's unlikely only because John Green no longer owned those two people in 1819. However, 
it is very likely that they did work on the very building that I'm sitting in right now in 1812 because he still owned them at that time. So back to John Green. He's a very important man in Nyack history. He helped kickstart this county into a place that buzzed with life, with industry, with commerce. Hey, by 1860, when we had 2,000 people here, we all had gas heat, we all had gas lamps, we all had gas stoves, and water ran to every house in the village. That's early. A lot of other places, that wouldn't happen until the turn of the 20th century. We were modern, we were industrious, we were America, we were looking forward, but we still had that in our background. And as I said, it is likely that the building that I'm sitting in was built with slave labor. Almost certainly his pier and his lumber yard were built by slave labor. Now fast forward to today, the John Green House starting in 2015, uh, has started to be restored. Amazingly enough, the mortgage bank that owned the deed of that property when it was foreclosed on actually donated it to the nonprofit John Green Preservation Coalition, and they have since then been working on restoring the house. Uh, it's ongoing. I'm sure they could probably use donations at this point, but even realizing that Mr. Green was a slaveholder and did something that we do not approve of at all today, he was important to the history of Rockland County, and I think that it is a good idea to restore his house. However, we should not forget. We need to make sure that whatever historical markers and discussions come along with John Green that we mention the negative side of him as well as all of the positives. There you have it. So that's my armchair walking tour of John Green. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I hope you've learned something. And I look forward to seeing you all again at some time when we're all not behind masks and hiding behind doors and socially distanced. Until then, stay safe and stay healthy. Mm -hmm.